Thank you for participating in our BC Technical Webinar Series. We will be covering an overview of current topics in radiation safety. Today's webinar session is worth one voice credit. In order to receive this credit, you must complete the online test with a passing score of 80% or above. You may take the test more than once if need be. A certificate will be emailed to you at the close of this webinar and following successful completion of the online test. Please keep this certificate as proof of your completion of this webinar. During today's webinar, we are going to touch on the following topics. A general radiation safety update to include where the regulations stem from, who is considered a radiation worker, and limits and radiation conversions for the units of radioactivity. We will also discuss ALARA at length, and this will include some examples of what is currently being offered for radiation protection. Next, we will talk about the 2011 event where radioactive bluefin tuna were found on the west coast of the United States, which had come from Japan from the Fukushima disaster. We will then finish up with a discussion of what the Transportation Security Administration is using during security screenings at the airport. So let us begin with a general radiation safety update. All of the regulations that we live and breathe by in nuclear medicine and molecular imaging stem from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, or NRC. The NRC has two codes in particular that affect our departments. The first is 10 CFR 20, which is Title 10 Energy, Code of Federal Regulations, Part 20. This is where all of the general standards for radiation protection can be found. The document contains, but is not limited to, provisions for radiation protection programs, dose limits for both the public and occupational workers, surveys, and storage of licensed material. The second is 10 CFR 35. This is Title 10, Code of Federal Regulations, Part 35. In it are the general administrative and technical requirements for who can use or handle radioactive materials, information on sealed, unsealed, and brachytherapy sources, and regulations on what records and reports need to be kept. It also contains the requirements and provisions for the medical use of byproduct materials in medicine and for issuance of specific licenses authorizing the medical use of this material. These requirements and provisions provide for the radiation safety of workers, the general public, patients, and human research subjects. Ten CFR 20 states that personnel monitoring for occupational dose is required if the sum of external and internal effective dose equivalent, or EDE, could be expected to exceed 10% of the annual whole body occupational limit. Sites can, and perhaps should, set lower exposure action levels as part of an ALARA program. Your Radiation Safety Officer, or RSO, will set the limits for your individual site. These limits can be monitored monthly or quarterly, depending on your site. Contact your RSO if you have any questions regarding the exposure limits at your facility. A radiation worker, by definition, is anyone who works with or in the vicinity of radioactive materials or radiation-producing machines. Radiation workers are allowed by regulation to receive 50 times the exposure that the general public may receive. Therefore, a radiation worker is allowed to receive 5,000 milligrams per year. 
the general public is only allowed to receive 100 millirems per year. Let's talk about wearing radiation badges. In general, whole body badges should be worn between the waist and shoulders, outside of any clothing, and on the portion of the body nearest to the radiation source with the window facing outward. Ring badges should be worn on the prominent hand, under gloves, and with the window facing inward toward the source. Technologists working with 511 KEV isotopes should have a ring badge for both hands, and they should be changed monthly. Where should radiation badges be stored? Store in a radiation-free area. This does not mean in the hot lab. Even if you make the argument that the badges stored by or behind the door are not in the proximity of the sources, you still walk through the doorway carrying doses, and the badges run the risk of being exposed to the radioactive source. Best practice would be to find someplace else within your department to store your badge. Do not store a badge in direct sunlight, and do not store it in a hot car. This includes the temptation to attach your radiation badges to your hospital ID and subsequently hang it from your rear view mirror until tomorrow or Monday. Do not wash your badge with your clothes. However, if you do, don't put it in the dryer. Accidentally washing your badge does not deem it ruined. If this happens, contact your RSO the next day for instructions on what to do in this instance. The maximum permissible dose equivalent for occupational exposure is different for different parts of the body. For instance, the skin can receive 15 REMS in any one year, and the hands 75 REMS in any one year. That said, the prospective annual limit for the whole body is 5 REMS per year. A pregnant worker may only receive 0.5 REM during the whole gestation period. Women who are pregnant should have a fetal badge that is worn around the belly area and it should be replaced every month. There is an official NRC guide titled Instruction Concerning Prenatal Radiation Exposure to address the issue of pregnant radiation workers. What is the lifetime radiation limit you are allowed to receive? The NRC guideline is as follows. N minus 18 times 5 REMS. In this example, the letter N stands for age. Therefore, the calculation for a 29-year-old would be 29 minus 18 equals 11 times 5 equals 55 REMS, which equals 55,000 millirems. If you were 58, the calculation would be 58 minus 18, which equals 40, times 5 equals 200 REMS, which equals 200,000 millirems. This slide contains radiation conversion. So, for the units of radioactivity, we have the common unit of the mercury, and the SI unit being the megabecquerel. 1 millicuri equals 37 megabecquerel. For the absorbed dose, the common unit is the rad, and the SI unit is the gray. So 100 rad is equal to 1 gray. When we are measuring the dose equivalent, we have the common unit rem, and the SI unit is the sievert. So 100 rem is equal to 1 sievert. For exposure, the units are the Rentkin and the Coulomb per kilogram. 
3,875 Rentkin equals 1 Coulomb per kilogram. The definition of rad is the amount of energy that radioactive sources deposit in materials through which they pass. A rem is equal to the absorbed dose multiplied by the quality factor of the type of radiation, which for X and gamma rays is 1. So it comes down to 1 Rankin equals 1 rad equals 1 rem, or 1 gray equals 1 sievert, which equals 1 coulomb per kilogram. This is a list of general radiation safety rules. Always wear disposable gloves when handling sources, and change them often. This includes drawing up doses, injecting and transportation of radioactive materials, regardless of the type or size of dose. If a dose is handed to you, a good rule is to always assume it is contaminated and treat it as such. Always wear your radiation badges. Take the time to locate them and wear them properly. This is the only way to permanently track your exposure. We should all take this step very seriously. No eating, drinking, smoking, applying cosmetics, or fixing contact lenses in a radiation area. This includes the hot lab, the treadmill room, and any bathrooms marked as radiation areas. All sources should be marked with the date and time. If you are drawing the dose, make sure you are recording the correct information on the label. Should the dose not be labeled, or is labeled incorrectly, do not use it. Use absorbent paper to protect surfaces from contamination. Some of these areas include the counters of the hot lab, the area behind the L-shield, the inside of the dose carriers, the counters where the dose is placed in the stress room, and the injection table. Survey these areas daily and change the absorbent paper regularly. Survey hands and decontaminate them to background levels before leaving the department. Contaminated trash must be stored 10 half-lives until it decays to background. Contaminated trash should be labeled, at the minimum, with the date, isotope, and initial reading. Contaminated trash should be stored behind lead or in a designated long-term radioactive storage area, depending on the isotope being stored. Contaminated equipment must be decontaminated to less than 1 millirems per hour on contact or securely stored until contamination has decayed to background. This includes treadmills. If the treadmill is unable to be properly cleaned, the contaminated areas should be covered in lead and the treadmill not used until it has decayed to background. Always carry sources in appropriately shielded containers. This includes all sources, even those used for quality control. If you are working with PET isotopes, there are special shields available for syringes and special carrying cases. When handling a syringe that contains radioactive isotope, be sure to keep the plunger and needle ends pointed away from you so that the syringe shield can protect you from the radiation. All radioactive materials must be secure at all times. It is a regulation that access to hot labs should be limited at all times in order to prevent individuals from unnecessary exposure. Best practice would be to keep the hot lab locked at all times. Notify the RSO of any spills. Contact them immediately, along with the chief tech, and start the decontamination process. It is a good idea for all departments to have a decontamination kit available at all times. When cleaning a spill, begin at the outside of the spill 
and work inward to avoid any further contamination. Now we will move on to the Alara principle. Alara stands for as low as reasonably achievable. We are all aware that we are working with radioactive materials and will be exposed to some level of radiation. Alara is the principle guiding us to keep our exposures to a minimum. This principle assumes that there is no threshold for inducing biological effects and therefore any dose of radiation carries with it some risk. In other words, there is no level of safe radiation. So how do we keep our exposure as low as reasonably achievable? We use the principles of time, distance, and shielding. On this slide, there are some areas where we can probably reduce our exposure levels simply by being aware of how we are working and applying the concepts of time, distance, and shielding. Many times during the day, it is not the syringe, point source, or CT that is exposing us to radiation, but rather the patient. Below is a list and some ideas to think about as we move through our day. Delivery of radiopharmaceuticals. Here are some questions that maybe you should ask yourself. Is the syringe being held with the plunger or needle ends facing the tech? Is the syringe staying in the dose carrier until we are ready to inject? Or is it being laid on the counter next to us? Are we taking advantage of remote injectors if they are available? Transportation of patients. How close to the back of the wheelchair are we standing when transporting a patient? How close to the patient are we standing when walking them either out of the department or into the scan room? Cleaning up spills. This includes patient blood or body fluids. We need to consider how quickly we can clean spills or cover the contamination when necessary. Holding or lifting patients. Here's a practical one that happens every day in every department. We should be aware of how long we are standing or sitting directly next to a patient and where our radiation badge is during this time. Standing next to the treadmill and subsequently standing next to a newly injected patient. Is there a way to reduce the time or especially distance during this period? CT portion of spec CT or PET CT. In this new world of PET CT and spec CT, we need to be aware of the CT portion exposing us to x-rays. Be sure to stand behind a leaded shield or leaded wall anytime the CT tube is active even if it is only going to be used at a low MAS for attenuation correction purposes. Filling phantoms. Make sure you wear ring badges when filling phantoms. Filling phantoms for QC or ACR can be time intensive. Phantom mixing can be a source for high ring badge readings. To mix the phantom, consider placing absorbent paper on the floor and rolling the phantom back and forth with your foot. This slide lists the common isotopes used in nuclear medicine and molecular imaging. Notice that the energies range from 120 keV all the way up to 511 keV. With that, there is a huge discrepancy in the amount of lead that is needed for shielding. The lower energy isotopes need 0.9 millimeters of lead to shield it to 1 in 1 tenth of the original strength. As we move into gallium, 4.7 millimeters of lead is needed, and when we are dealing with PET isotopes, 
the tenth value layer of lead is 13.7 millimeters. 13.7 millimeters of lead is approximately 0.53 inches. The more lead needed, the heavier the shield becomes and certainly the more costly. Whether or not you remember the exact tenth value layers for the isotopes is not important. You can look that up. But just remember that using PET isotopes requires 13 times more lead. Now we will dig deeper into the difference between the isotopes used in nuclear medicine and those used in PET. Let's consider the dose rate we are getting from patients. Earlier, we discussed how we should try to reduce our time next to the patient when transporting, holding, or injecting them. Here, we are putting some numbers behind those considerations. If you inject a patient with 30 millicuries of technetium 99M, say MDP for a bone scan, which you may or may not be doing in this era, of reducing exposures from diagnostic medical tests, and you took a reading at one meter, the dose rate would be 0.6 millirems per hour. In contrast, a patient injected for a whole body F18 FDG scan with 12 millicuries would give a dose rate of four millirems per hour. That is over a four-fold difference in the dose rate for patients injected for a technetium study versus an F18 FDG scan. Why is PET different? PET isotopes have higher exposure rate constants compared to traditional nuclear medicine isotopes. This means we will have the potential for higher badge readings. If we are smart about it and really apply the Alara principle, the increase should be minimal. PET gamma ray energies are about three and a half times higher. This means we not only need more shielding, but the proper shielding. PET half-lives are markedly shorter. The half-lives for nuclear medicine isotopes are measured in hours and days. The half-lives for PET isotopes are measured in minutes and seconds, which we will see on the next slide. Gallium, thallium, and indium have half-lives of two to three days. Technetium is measured in approximately six hours and the PET isotopes are measured in minutes or seconds. 109.8 minutes for F18 and 75 seconds for rubidium-82. Some areas where we can consider reducing the time are the time it takes us to transport the dose, the time it takes us to inject a patient, the time it takes us to check on a patient if they are in a quiet room, the time it takes us to take a patient to the bathroom, and the time it takes us to position the patient. This is basically the hurry up principle. The faster you work, the lower your dose. The trick is to limit the time in proximity to radioactivity. The calculation for how much exposure you will receive is dose equals exposure times time. Decreasing the dose using distance is the backup principle. If you increase the distance from the source, you will reduce the exposure by one-fourth. This is the inverse square law. One real world issue when it comes to reducing exposure via distance in the world of performing PET scans has to do with real estate. Many years ago, we installed gamma cameras in our department and shielded the walls for 140 keV. The camera sat in the middle of the room and there was plenty of space to walk away from the source. Today, we are pulling out those systems and replacing them with PET or PET-CT 
or SPECT-CT systems, all of which are very big. These systems are filling up the room with equipment, and there is no place for the text to essentially back up. Sometimes the only place to put the operator's counsel is in the same room as the equipment at a less than desirable distance from the sources. When we talk about reducing our exposure from shielding, this is the put-up principle. This is clearly the most expensive of all of the principles and not all shielding is created equal. The shielding needed for PET is many times thicker and much more expensive than the shielding you need for nuclear medicine. This slide shows the 10th value layer of lead for nuclear medicine and molecular imaging isotopes. The 10th value layer is the thickness of lead needed to stop 90% of the photons from penetrating the material. For technetium 99M, that value is 0.9 millimeters. For F18, the value is 13.7 millimeters. The takeaway here is that you need 13 times more lead to stop PET isotopes than with standard nuclear medicine isotopes. There are three practical materials that can serve as barriers for 511 KEV isotopes. The first and cheapest, if there is such a thing, is lead. It is also very heavy. Lead glass is widely used in portable shields and control room windows. It takes 2.65 centimeters to stop 90% of the 511 KEV photons. Tungsten is an excellent barrier material in that only 0.89 centimeters of lead is needed to stop 90% of the emitted photons. This material is widely used in syringe shields. Unfortunately, it is very expensive. X-ray aprons offer little to no protection for 511 KeV photons. Although helpful for energies of less than 120 KeV, 91% of the 511 KeV photons will get through the apron. It is entirely possible that the bulk and weight of wearing a lead apron might cause one to have an increase in exposure because the time on task might be longer. This is a screen from RADPRO Calculator, a free online tool found at www.radprocalculator.com. This site allows you to calculate the dose received from a given set of inputs. The program also allows the user to choose the desired dose rate units, as well as the activity unit and the distance unit. Once the activity and distance are entered, the Calculate button is pressed and the calculated dose rate is outputted. For this example, F18 was selected as the isotope. The dose rate unit is millirems per hour. Activity unit millicuries. 20 millicuries was entered as the activity at a distance of one meter. Given these inputs, the calculated dose rate is 11.37 millirems per hour. When the Add Shielding button is checked, lead was chosen for the shield material. The units of centimeters was chosen and a thickness of 1.37 centimeters was entered, which is the 10th value layer for lead for a 511 KeV isotope. As you can see, the newly calculated dose rate is 1.01 millirems per hour, or a tenth of what the calculated dose rate was without shielding. There are many other calculations available on the RADPRO calculator website. 
such as radiological unit conversions and decay calculations. Shown here are two typical hot lab L shields. On the left is the standard 140 keV L shield used in the hot lab. On the right is a much thicker and heavier L shield used when working with PET doses. Instead of purchasing a PET grade L shield, placing lead bricks behind the front plate of the standard nuclear medicine L shield will provide adequate protection from 511 keV photons. Rolling shields can be used for protection from hot patients that are sitting or laying down. Shown here are three examples of rolling shields. The picture on the left has leaded glass at the top, which enables techs to see the patients while still being protected from the photons. The top right picture contains a rolling shield that can be raised or lowered depending on the height requirement for shielding or injection, as some of these shields have automatic injectors attached to them. The bottom right picture is a clever way to avoid having to install lead in the walls around the injection chair. Shielding containers for PET are becoming more and more abundant. This is one company's solution for transporting PET doses. The shield on top of the dose cart opens, and the pig containing the dose fits into the clam shell. The shell is then closed, and the cart can be pushed to the patient's side for injection. There is also an unleaded drawer on this cart that can be used for injection supplies. This is more of an all-encompassing solution to pet shielding. This table contains the following items that will provide shielding for 511 keV isotopes. It contains an L block, a dose calibrator, and a Sharps container. This one piece of equipment will provide the end user with the necessary shielding solutions for examining the dose. Syringe shields are an integral part of every nuclear medicine department. Shown here are two different versions of syringe shields. The top shield contains a window of lead glass so that the technologist can see the fluid level in the syringe. The bottom shield does not have a leaded glass viewpoint, and both are made of tungsten. For these shields, a thumb screw keeps the shield attached to the syringe. These shields are available to fit various sizes of syringes, and the weight varies with size. Recently, some companies have instituted a variation on the thumb screw method of securing the shield to the syringe. These syringe shields have a flanged locking mechanism. That secures the shield to the syringe by turning the nut on the top of the shield. These are again available with or without a leaded glass window and the weight varies by size. Some of the newer dose pigs also have a hexagonal cutout for these shields to fit directly into the pig and or the dose injector. Let's now change gears and talk a little bit about the Fukushima disaster. On March 11, 2011, there was an earthquake and a tsunami near Japan. This wave caused a series of equipment failures and meltdowns at the Fukushima nuclear power plant. As a result of this disaster, at least six workers have exceeded their lifetime legal limits for radiation exposure, 
and more than 300 have received significant radiation exposure. In August 2011, Bluefin tuna, carrying five times the background activity of cesium-137 and cesium-134, were reported off the coast of San Diego. As the power plant leaked and continues to leak cesium into the ocean, fish, including bluefin tuna, swim through it and ingest the cesium-134, or eat organisms that have. Then they swim to the west coast of the United States. The bluefin tuna is of particular concern as it is a common source for sushi. It is the finding the cesium-134 that confirmed that the fish came from the coast of Japan. Because cesium-134 is only generated by human activities, cesium-134 is a byproduct of nuclear power plants and the making of weapons. The half-life is 2.06 years. It undergoes beta decay, producing barium-134 directly and emitting a 1.6 MeV gamma ray in the process. Naturally, bluefin tuna contains one becquerel of cesium-137. After the Fukushima disaster, Tuna off the coast of San Diego was reported to contain 5 becquerel and cesium-137. Since April 2011, government inspectors have tested all seafood imports that arrive from Japanese waters. The reports indicate that the fish are safe for human consumption. What is of higher concern is the mercury levels in the yellowfin tuna and buckyballs that are invading California beaches. Buckyballs are uranium-filled nanospheres that stick to each other and land on beaches. In an official report from the NRC, it states that bluefin tuna equals less than 1 BED, which is a banana equivalent dose. That takes us to the next logical question which is what is a banana equivalent dose, or BED. In nature, bananas contain 0.0117% of radioactive potassium-40. It decays with a half-life of about 1.25 billion years and emits both a positron and a 238 keV beta. This leaves us with approximately 80 becquerel per banana, or 0.00000 millicuries. So, if you ate one banana per day for 365 days, you would consume about 2,000 micro-rems per year. This information can be found in the reference listed below. Banana equivalent dose is an official unit of radiation measurement and is referenced by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. A bluefin tuna contains less than one banana equivalent dose per fish. This slide shows some interesting and humorous equivalents for eating bananas. For example, if you consume 50 bananas, it is the equivalent of getting a dental x-ray. 70,000 bananas will get you as much equivalent exposure as a chest CT scan, and eating 80 million bananas will literally kill you. Security scanning machines at airports is another topic of interest. The Transportation Security Administration uses advanced imaging technology to screen passengers before boarding. There are two types of X-ray systems. The first is a standard X-ray, in which images are created based upon the absorption or non-absorption of the objects being scanned. The more dense the object, the more the X-rays are absorbed, 
and the lighter the object appears on film. The inverse is also true. The second type of X-ray system is the backscatter X-ray. Here, images are created when materials scatter X-rays. And this is the technology used in airports. Backscatter technology is based on the Compton scattering effect of X-rays. However, unlike a traditional X-ray machine, which relies on the transmission of X-rays through the object, a backscatter X-ray machine detects the radiation that reflects from the object and forms an image. The backscatter pattern is dependent on the material property and is good for imaging organic material. These systems will typically only create a 2D image, which makes this technology ideal for security screening because images are taken from both sides of the body. Each back scatter scan will give a dose of 0.005 millirem to 0.009 millirem per scan. It would take about 200 scans per year to reach a minor dose, and the exposure is only equivalent to about 2-3 to three minutes of flying. The other technology used for airport screenings is called millimeter wave technology. Images are created using non-ionizing radio waves or low-level microwaves. With active scanners, the millimeter wave is transmitted from two antennas simultaneously as they rotate around the body. The wave energy reflected back from the body or other objects on the body is used to construct a three-dimensional image, which is displayed on a remote monitor for analysis. The energy generated from these systems is 10,000 times less than a cell phone. In summary, general Alara principles of time, distance, and shielding should be followed when handling any radiation source. Radiation shielding solutions, especially for PET, continue to evolve. Bluefin tuna swimming to the west coast from Japan does not contain a significant amount of radiation. And airport x-ray systems are emitting a very low dose of x-rays per scan. The next few slides are resource slides. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed our webinar on the current topics in radiation safety. Please do not forget to take your test and remember that you must score an 80% or above to receive your certificate.